Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon. SoonerCon is Central Oklahoma's longest running pop culture convention. It is held in Norman, Oklahoma, and the next event is scheduled for June 24th through 26th, 2022. You can go to SoonerCon.com to sign up and get early bird pricing on admission. The Hellmouth Convention. The Hellmouth Convention is a celebration of fandoms such as Buffy, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. It is scheduled for June 3rd through 5th, 2022 in Los Angeles, California. All proceeds raised will benefit various charities. Please go to thehellmouth.org for more information. On tap today, we have Jen Sanders. How are you doing today? Doing well, thanks, Aaron. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I am glad to have you here. You are a good friend of one of my good friends, and you have a new writing project coming out mm-hmm. that I'm really excited to hear about. We're excited to tell you about it. We're very excited and proud of it. Okay. And I love independent authors. I love the sci-fi fantasy genre. It's something that I think that we're getting the chance to have people really make a difference there and see their work come to fruition a lot faster than it used to. Can yeah, you tell me what you guys true. are working on? Um, well, we've been working on a series called The Fae Touched Chronicles. Um, it's a series of four books. We just finished the fourth one and it's coming out on the 20th. So it's coming out this Friday. Um, it's, uh, it's a series of, uh, well, the first book, um, yeah, I got to organize my brain. Hold on. Um, the first book, uh, introduces you to the group of friends, um, from boarding school. This is set in the Victorian era and it's four friends from boarding school. And it's sort of the, each book follows, uh, uh, their journey to romance, but it's also magic and adventure and fantasy. Um, and uh, the first book is about a, a young Lord, Scottish Lord named Geordie, who, um, whose father is murdered um, and he meets the love of his life. She is an Oracle, so she predicts the future. And the two of them realize that whatever came for his father is now coming for him. So they have to find their way through that uh, and try to come out safely on the other side. And in that same book, we're introduced to the other three. Uh, the next book um, is about um, Ross, who is a young Irish doctor and who has magic of his own, but due to circumstances in the book, he can't access it. He is kidnapped along with um, the younger sister of the heroine in the first book. And the two of them have to make their way across Scotland on foot to try and get home safely, but also being stopped by our murderer, because, you know, why not? Um, The third book is called Lady of the Loch, and that is set on the shores of Loch Ness. Uh, And it does, it does feature the creature, um, but it also features some other stuff, uh, some, some, a bad guy and some adventure and some excitement. And the final book, um, it's called Agent of Change, and it focuses on the last of the, the group of four friends. Um, and he is an agent of the Queen who is uh, attempting to retrieve his son uh, that he never knew he had from the Fey realm because the child fell into that realm by accident. He's trying to get him back. Wow. So you, are you releasing these books simultaneously? No, no, no. The first one came out in um, March. Okay. Um, Sears Choice came out in March, and then Healer's Touch came out in uh, April, and then we released uh, Lady of the Lock at the beginning of this month, and we're releasing this one a little bit early because we're going to be attending a convention in June um, in Hutchinson, and um, we wanted to have all four books ready to go. Which convention are you heading to? Smallville. Smallville. I have not been to that, but I've heard really, really good things. Oh, fingers crossed, because I'm driving from Pennsylvania. So, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Kansas conventions, from what I've seen, because they're kind of so far out there, you get a chance to really have this big, big event in this very, very small space. It becomes a little community. Yeah, well, we're really looking forward to it. Um, Got big plans for a giveaway and... uh... Kristen's been working hard on a bunch of, um, oh, she's been working on bookmarks and uh, trailers for each of the books. And just, it's really, it's really amazing. She's, uh, she's so talented in so many ways. I really pretty much just write. And sometimes I sew things. 
and I want to remind our folks, she has been on a very early episode of this show, so you may want to swing back to that and double check that once you get done with this episode. Yeah, check out everything that she does. She has uh, written a trilogy and then another standalone novel by herself. Um, but she was kind enough to do this with me. But why did you want to do it? What made you say, this is the story that I really need to put down on paper? Well, um, originally this story started as a birthday gift. Kristen asked me for a birthday gift of a story. So I started writing um, a story about these uh, young men and it kind of snowballed from there. And there came a point where we definitely realized that it could turn into a very good book series. Um, I think what made us want to publish it is the characters are great. They're, they're fun and they're entertaining and they're kind and they're thoughtful and gentle and adventurous and brave and all of those things that, you know, we all wish we were all the time. Um, and uh, the storylines we felt were just really very interesting and, and thought provoking. And so we went for it. We've had excellent response. You you sit down with your, your best friend and mm -hmm. you, she wants a story for a birthday gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> is, is this an arrangement you've had for a while? Uh, well, we met years ago, probably 20 years ago um, on a writer's uh, website. And, um, you know, I have other books out uh, under my, you know, under the Jennifer Sanders name. Um, so we both knew that we were writers and so we both, I mean, we, that's how we met. Um, and so this was just a, a way to, it was just a fun way for her to say, hey, you know what I'd really like? I'd really like this customized story um, with the following elements. And I was like, well, I can do that. So I did. And then here we are. That is so cool. I wish people felt more comfortable with making those kinds of requests for a gift rather than, oh, dear Lord, the, the big box of candy at CVS, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I always prefer things that have been made or created by somebody that I that loves me because I, it's more personal and you can't get it from anyone else or in any other way, so. And you That's, turned this into a gift for anybody who would have an interest in this. <laughs> yeah, I guess we did. Anybody who enjoys uh, period romance and adventure and magic and fantasy and apparently there's a new hashtag out there, romanticy. And we fit right in that, right in that niche. Kind of surprised it took that long for romanticy to be a thing. <laughs> I, you know what? I only just heard of it. It may have been around forever, but I'm not very finger on the pulse, I'm afraid. So, well, sure, but I, people, it, it's been a while since since I think the fantasy genre has really kind of lent itself to romance the way we think of it. Oh. Well, I have to say that I think if you scratch the surface a little bit, um, romance tends to get kind of denigrated by a lot of folks because it's, uh, you know, it's for a particular, I don't know, the, the happily ever after. I made real it. And, yay. <laughs> We're being joined by Kristen Stobel, who is also Hi. one of the authors. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we were just talking about how romance and fantasy are this thing that should have been a, a combination a long time ago. And it's just now that people are talking about it with a specific term. Yeah. And we're just yeah. wondering why that train took so long to get to the station. Well, I think for a long time, it was kind of a boys game. That's exactly what I was starting to say that <laughs> romance, romance is often denigrated by folks who, you know, think that it's just fluff for, for girls. And not even like grown women. There are plenty of grown women that I know that won't read a romance novel because somehow it, I don't know, turns them pink and sparkly by accident. Um, <laughs> I you feel know, like that's a good reason to read it. Right? I, I'd be <laughs> on board with that. So um, I always prefer a side of romance at least. Um, so, and this one, this one is heavier on the romance than I think either one of us usually does, but yeah. what the heck? <laughs> it was fun anyway. I'm yeah. assuming Sears choice fun because of it. I mean, I think it was very fun. Yeah, yeah, it was. And I think it actually, <laughs> uh, I was actually having a conversation with my mom last night about how we did put a lot of little nuggets in Sears choice for what's to come. And she wants to go back and reread now and see those little, little bits Easter of information. Eggs. Yeah. 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 It's just, uh, there we go. 
Well, as the, the boy in the room, I, I just kind of want to toss out that so much of the, the romance that gets tossed our ways boils down to James Bond gets the girl at the end. Yeah. That's, that's really the depth that we get fed when it comes to romance. And I think we do like it, but we really prefer it be something with a little more substance than we've been given. We don't know how to ask for it. Mm. I think that's probably fair. Um, I, I know my husband has been reading the books and he's been enjoying them and he's definitely a guy. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that, I think that, um, society in general boils down masculine romance to James Bond is really cool and gets the girl at the end because he's just a, he's just a, a, a cool a, dude. A cool dude. Yeah. <laughs> he's just, yeah. He's, um, we delve a little bit into a little bit more into what, what it actually takes to get the girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we also we kind of because we have two characters who are sort of james bond type characters and we show that they have depth and they get the girl not because they're a cool dude but because of the the depth of character that they have and mm -hmm. them actually seeing this person for who she is so i think we even we even go further in that yep I think that's I think that's definitely true. I would like to say that I think guys would enjoy these books as much as anybody. Um, certainly, my son has enjoyed them. Also, definitely a guy. Um, I mean, I I think he probably read them out of a sense of filial obligation, but <laughs> <laughs> but he enjoyed them anyway. So yeah, you know that's what's important. It's yeah. important. you yeah. got to wield the mom. <clears throat> Excuse me, you got to wield that mom power a little bit. A little bit, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> So. Yeah. yeah. So, is there a type of struck? Is there a type of, of connection that you're looking to get out of these characters when you say you're you're trying to discover who she is and that that's how you get the girl? Is there? And I know you don't want to do spoilers, so I'm really trying not to make <laughs> you have to do spoilers. But I'm just wondering if there was some sort of some deep secret that you wanted her to have, or or, or deep, deep mystery box to put in her character. I just I think it's it's mostly just showing them as fully developed human beings with yeah. thoughts and emotions and I mean we certainly talk about like what would make characters connect with each other but not in any kind of this person has like this special thing that would make the person love them you know yeah I don't think there's any mystery box about it I mean I would use an example which is not a spoiler uh, because it is not from the Fate Touch Chronicles but from uh, the movie Frozen Two where uh, the character Anna is uh, trying very hard to accomplish a very important and terrifying task. And her boyfriend comes galloping out of the trees on a reindeer and scoops her up. And instead of saying anything like, I got you, or I'll take care of you, or, you know, he just says, what do you need? And I think that's the most romantic thing that's ever happened in any Disney movie. <laughs> honestly <laughs> he's like hey you're a human being i trust you you have agency like that what do you need encompasses so much um for that couple and so we tried to do something i think similar where the the guys respect understand and respect that the women are who they are um and they don't they don't try to they don't idolize them they don't put them on a pedestal and they don't try to change them they trust them um and they love who they are not some not because they're pretty or because they're wealthier because they're they offer whatever other rewards it's a partnership yeah the partnership and that's and those are the relationships that i myself prefer to read where it's not one person always saving the other it's a partnership because in reality sometimes one person needs saved and sometimes the other one does and that's just reality you know and and so it's just that give and take that back and forth understanding that sometimes one person is going to hold up the other one and and other times it'll be reversed and i think that that's something that we really we do well with our characters mm -hmm. so we don't we don't go the the route of nobody withholds vital information in order to protect the other one nobody does that because that's a really bad idea <laughs> almost always because it's also when you do something like that you're withholding agency and so nobody withholds anybody else's agency nobody else Nobody withholds anybody's um, choices or everything. We try to make sure that everybody, and, and in both directions, that, that oh, yeah. everybody's yeah. thoughts and feelings and choices are validated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's not to say that they don't occasionally make mistakes or, you know, 
because yeah. they are human as well. And, and characters yeah. that are infallible are not fun to read. They're not interesting. Right. But, um, I mean, we definitely have, there's definitely conflict, but the conflict I think comes from more organic places, sort of an artificial construct of. Oh, you're all kinds you know, of decision for go. everyone else. But what, what did I do? There was a little bit of an audio glip there, but it, it seems to have been oh. resolved. Yeah. And, and what you were saying got across, it was just like a little blip. <laughs> okay. You went like, anyway. uh, yeah, a little space age for a second there. So the way to take agency away from somebody is audio difficulties. That's apparently the lesson we're learning right here. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And that's my next book is actually about this exact thing. The audio difficulty. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly, there, exactly. There is a story there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. It might be a little too deep for me to dig for it, but. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it sounds kind of complex having to create that that romance and make it interesting via zoom <laughs> thinking of that though about the concept of making agency and then trying to make complex characters do you two have a way you introduce flaws to the character do you have to stand and plan it out or is it something that just kind of flows once they start interacting with the other characters i'm gonna let you take that <laughs> oh joy I mean, I think that we each kind of have our own process because we write back and forth in character. So I think, you know, I know at least for myself, I'll be thinking about the characters, whether or not we're working on them. That's like my process, whether I'm co-writing or even on my own, I just, I'll kind of play with the characters and I'll think about things, whether or not they're relevant to the story, whether or not it comes up because I need to know. And I try to come up with like a phobia that they might have or something they're not good at. Um, one of my and he's still my Ross is still my favorite character to write <laughs> he's, he doesn't like public speaking and honestly he's really rather disorganized <laughs> so you know and he's addicted to cake he's addicted to all sweets cake is just the mm -hmm. favorite yeah so which has been terrible for my waistline because little Ross brain is going you know what would be good cake <laughs> so I mean things like that or or like one of my um female characters she just has a lack of self-confidence and really you know knowing who she is and that she can make those choices so that certainly brings that whole agency story up because the first book she's trying to find her agency mm -hmm. yep. uh, Chris, sorry go ahead mm -hmm. okay. Kristen I'm kind of glad you brought that up because in our first chat we spent a lot of time looking at how you work with the characters, how you build them up. You have a relationship with them before they even hit the screen. I know this about yeah. you. <laughs> yes. So I was actually kind of curious as to how that changes when another writer comes into the fold. I just tell her all of them. Yeah, it doesn't change. <laughs> she just gets bothered constantly by, hey, you know what I thought of? This person's favorite color is this. <laughs> yeah, like, I get a lot of texts in the middle of the night that are things like... <laughs> Because that's uh, what I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, somebody's favorite uh, drink is this, and it's because of these, the following five reasons. And <laughs> this is how we know. And yeah. And that's great. I mean, I, you know, somebody's got to be thinking about this stuff. It's, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> My characters just don't shut up. That's the problem. They just don't shut Ross particularly does not shut up. <laughs> A little like, stop, just stop. <laughs> Trying to sleep. <laughs> and I found that me personally, I have to at least kind of create a character profile before I can even really start on anything. I do very well just being handed somebody else's characters and playing with them like action figures. That's, that's something what my brain does. But you're the opposite. You will just you will just make them as you're going along. They just become part of your world. And Jen seems to be in the middle between this, these two extremes here. Well, I make up my own characters. I don't, I don't get into the same sort of, I don't get as granular as Kristen does because I don't, um, you know, unless it's needed. Um, but it is not to say that my characters don't have quirks and uh, preferences and things. It's just that my characters, I guess they don't live in my head rent-free quite the same way that they do that Chris's characters live in yeah. her head. In fairness, you have like, you know, you have kids and yeah. 
family and other adult things. Like, kids, yeah. Yeah, adult kids. Ooh. But that was and and someone has opinions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so my my characters really kind of do take on a very sort of not obviously a physical real they take on a, a life of their own and they become people I know and I care about. And I get yeah. very personally invested in them to where I miss them. Like I am going through grieving about the Fae Touch Chronicles being over. Like I am having some serious <laughs> like. Well, I, okay. So to be fair, I too am a little bit sad that, that yeah. it's over. Um, and I, I will also miss them, but I do compartmentalize more. No, no, they, I get very attached to my characters. They're my babies. Uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely my babies. And yeah, I, I think I'm more just, um, it, it, we've known these characters longer than we've For been a long working time. on the series. We've, we've mm-hmm. known them, not all of them, and not all of them in the the form that they are now, but we've known them for years. I was just trying to think about, because you had said that Ross was your favorite, and I was just trying to think about who was my favorite. And it's interesting. I don't, I don't know that I have one. I think I have a couple. So Elsie's definitely one of them. Tamsin, definitely one of them. But I think of the guys, my favorite to write is Jordy, always, because he's just, he just cracks me up. Yeah. See, that's what it is. It's my favorite to write, Ross. I really, yeah. Because he's just, he's easy to write, but he's also got all those layers to him. And yeah, I I find Jordy very easy to write. Um, Yeah. Because he's, you know, he's this big teddy bear who is also kind of a berserker. big teddy bear with grizzly mode (laughs) yeah yeah um and he also he knows perfectly well that people because of his size and his sort of disingenuous demeanor they think he's stupid and he's not stupid very smart but he he uses that to his advantage because he's smart (laughs) yeah because he knows that people think he's stupid right right and i have fun writing those layers because it's it entertains me yeah. See, and that's what it is. Ross entertains me. Writing him, he entertains me because I'm never entirely sure. This is the thing. Ross is never entirely sure how he's going to get out of any given situation. He just <laughs> he just exists. And then what happens, happens. And sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it does not. And as long as he gets Elsie and cake at the end of the day. <laughs> no, there's something to be said for just knowing what your end game is. Yeah. <laughs> for Ross, it's cake. <laughs> I'm saying this as a writer. It's not fun to write simple characters. I don't always understand why people will, you know, talk about having one dimensional characters. It's not fun to write those. Why would anybody try to make them? I don't know. I, you know, I think it's just got to be because they find it easier not to have to think about stuff. I mean, I, the, the thinking about stuff is what I enjoy. So, right. I guess right. it just depends on your approach. Um, Kristen's and my approach to writing these books was that we every book has two protagonists we each took one um and we alternated points of view um yep. and so but then there was a lot of sort of behind the <clears throat> behind the scenes like okay this is what she's really thinking <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so this is what's happening <laughs> right and then there was occasionally like i don't know how to respond to that <laughs> all right i'll go back and fix it so it doesn't it's not yeah. quite so yeah, yeah. It's so, really great when that happens too, because it's like all of a sudden the engine just falls out. You're like tootling along, and then all of a sudden, you're like, yep, and you're like, well, I don't, I don't have a nope. Although that did not happen very often, maybe once or twice a book. Yeah, and some of them I don't even know if we actually hit it. Well, Healer's yeah. touch just flowed. Yeah, I mean, I don't really think that it is necessarily a measure of anything other than, you know, a, a lack of clarity. Like if I'm writing something and I'm intending one thing and you're getting something else that you don't know how to respond to, then, right. then I need to go back and fix what I did so that so that you know what is supposed to, you know, you you get a better feeling for where we're headed because we we do outline it um, yeah. so that we know where we're going. You know, we know where point A and point B and point C are and how to hit those beats. So it's just a question of... of writing in such a way that the other person can pick up your baton and keep running um and occasionally we run off in crazy direction (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's true that has happened yeah like guys get back here what no stop stop doing that come over here stop flirting and 
we have a point to get across. Oh, they're gone. <laughs> they're gone. Uh, They've yep. left. <laughs> They've decided this is what we're doing. <laughs> Which happens more with me with the co-writing than by myself. Usually I can rein them in by myself. I'm like, no, you're doing this. But with the co-writing, then the characters they are like, go. Yeah. yeah, because they encourage each other to misbehave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I'm getting a feeling that some of the, the encouraging to misbehave happens behind the screen as well as on the page. Uh, Chris and I together in person are an adventure. <laughs> we really are. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a special time. <laughs> Yep. yeah yeah no it's surely not it, we, we we stay completely focused all the time surely Absolutely. it's not our fault it's the yeah. character's fault yeah there's a little there's a little egging in the background but it's the tiniest bit the occasional bit. youtube video of listen to this song while we write this <laughs> Soundtrack. Oh, guided writing. That is a can of worms by itself. <laughs> that almost makes me feel like I'm back in like sophomore year creative writing class with my teacher telling me to just write whatever. And then mm, <laughs> that's a scary place to go. Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't really, I mean, I guess Kristen does it. I don't, I don't really play music while I'm writing because then I tend to start typing the lyrics. <laughs> I don't not... usually, I, I usually do more uh, cinematic music if I'm going to do it while I'm writing, because the lyrics, yes, they I'll just I'll do it while like... I'm plotting. I mean, I'll listen to music while I'm plotting. I also find that I plot better in the bathtub than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. I, have a, I have a theory that it's because I've gone back to my primeval self and I'm floating in. <laughs> <laughs> really cool. Uh, there, there was an episode I did with John Vorhaus, who is a, a sitcom writer among many, many other things. And we talked about creating in the shower. And I had kind of the same observation you did, is like you are in water surrounded by stone. There is not really a more basic state for you to be in. Yep. And he kind of observed, there's actually an ionization that happens when the water falls that triggers your brain's creativity. Yeah, I think that's true. I think I have, and I suspect it's a combination of both. Plus mm-hmm. also, generally speaking, unless your kids are little, uh, you don't get disturbed when you're in the tub. I, you know, <laughs> when my kids were little, they would just walk in. I'd be like, oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> like cats. <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't do that anymore because they're both in, you know, they're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, no, so I, I feel like uh, plotting to music is a thing. Writing to music, the rhythm tends to sort of, I start feeling like I got to type faster or slower. Or, right, I don't know, yeah, I get distracted. Yeah. Yeah, no, I actually very rarely have music playing while I'm I'm writing. Sometimes if I want to get a mood for a scene, I'll listen to like something very cinematic right before I write that scene. If I kind of start to like stall out, I'll listen to the song again just to get that mood. But I rarely actually listen to it while I'm writing because it does throw you off another tool that we that we use when we're sharing stuff is uh face claims I guess Mm -hmm. it's you know like here's here's what my character looks like and then everybody's able to describe everybody Um, mental casting yeah yeah Aaron knows I'm mentally cast. Yes. He heard about Ben Barnes. But it's, yes. a, it's a similar thing. I mean, to my mind, it's a similar thing. Like it's what is, you know, plotting to music, if not just sort of soundtracking your own internal movie. Right, right. It's just creating, it's just a tool to create the visuals and the mood and the, the feel of a scene. And it, particularly in co-writing, it helps because then you and I both know what we're looking at. Yep. And we always create lovely things to look at. <laughs> <laughs> so we do uh, we have produced some prose where we both kind of sit back and fold our arms and go dang that was that was good that was, yeah that's good you did a good job yeah, yeah. this is amazing <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well if you have the chance to sit down and make anything you want with anybody you want in any place you want it's got to be a very specific reason if that's going to be unpleasant. That's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I mean, we've got our horror fans that just want to, you know, have their HR Geiger visions of hell and there is a place for <laughs> that, but that's not my day to day. No, no, but it's more than just enjoying it. It's, it's, um, I, th- I think that we both bring each other up. Right. So I think that, um, in our specific partnership, I think that we both tend to help the other one right to a higher standard. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because we really do on occasion, look at a, look at a section and go, look at the words. They're all in pretty places. And they did, <laughs> they made a thing that looks really nice. Um, yeah. and it wouldn't necessarily be, I mean, I could probably produce something really pretty by myself, but gosh, it comes so much easier when there's somebody, when you've got a cheerleader and somebody offering, you know, ideas and yeah, bouncing saying, things just, to bounce things off yeah. of and or just change this one word, just this one word, and it's going to flow totally differently. And mm-hmm. then, yeah. And, then and I think we di- have, yeah, we have different strengths and weaknesses too. And I think mm-hmm. that they actually complement each other. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is dialogue, snappy mm. dialogue specifically. Mm-hmm. And mine is description. Uh, yes. You're I tend to just write point. floating heads. <laughs> I get to a point, she's like, okay, describe it. <laughs> like, yeah i'll be like here's a real snappy scene go in there and put them somewhere because they're just floating in space at the moment yeah 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 and sometimes i'm like wait what what and then we both (laughs) and then we both come up to a fight scene we'll be like um oh man you know and i (laughs) kind of you hear the breaks kind of yeah and i think part of it is the fight scenes are actually in my opinion a little harder to write back and forth it's almost easier if we both step back and kind of write it or fill in and then Mm -hmm. sort of mesh what's been done that's how we did it yeah that's That's how we did it we sort of took took a section and wrote it and then the other person would go in and be like well this is what my character would be doing and then the first person goes back in and goes okay well let's fix these other things but it it definitely starts in one brain and then yeah we kind of have to go back and forth and and, you know I have that sense of the I think I just I sort of visualize how it goes together I think maybe that's something that I do in my head a little bit more and so I tend to go in and go okay now he's gonna you said he hit him but how did he hit him because I'm not following so then I go in and I'm like okay and he swung down here and he bashed his face in here (laughs) like I go into the detail of of what's been done this guy flipped over and he landed on that yeah. What, was his skull bashed in with a mace or is this a Will Smith situation? I mean, we need those details. Exactly. That's yeah. what, what I, I provide. <laughs> For someone who can't see very well, yeah, I'm very exactly. visual. <laughs> so I think I'm living vicariously through seeing in my books. <laughs> well, how could you not? I, I mean, to be to be fair, if if you're if that's something that that compels you whether you you have that ability or not it's something you i okay to be fair i don't hear very well mm-hmm. that's something i struggle with and yet i i try to think a lot of the atmosphere that somebody's in what it, what's what are they aware of in their surroundings and i think it's probably the same thing mm-hmm. yeah yeah so yeah I, I do find that kristen is more visual in some ways but i I also try to think about what are they hearing? What are they smelling? What are they, you know, what are they tasting? Um, I don't know. I think that we, we fill in each other's gaps really well is kind of where we're at now. I mean, and in fairness, because I know that you tend to go toward the smells and the sounds. I like, I'll work on that more when I'm working by myself, but when we work together, I'm like, Jen's got it. I'll just, I'll just write what it looks like. And she'll other things. (laughs) I don't have to, so she's going to. (laughs) I, I mean, I think we both do that. Like, oh, Chris is going to do this part. So I'm just going to go over here and do this other thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then I live for when your characters introspect. I'm just like, oh, God, this is going to be good. <laughs> Introspection and mustache twirling oh my are God. my favorite things to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The bad guy's like, haha, I'm going to do all of these horrible, evil things. <laughs> and then is thwarted. I know. And like, the thing is, the thing is, people are like, why do villains do that? And I'm like, because writers think it's fun. Because it's fun. Because <laughs> it's really fun. Yeah. Totally so fun. And in fairness, I personally think that a mustache twirl is a lot of fun to read. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Because you also, you kind of want to know what the bad guy's end game is, especially if he's not going to get it. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. unless you're making the the villain a point of view character, there's really no way to to get that across, except to Mm -hmm. have the villain mustache twirl. Like that's, it's a tool. We need it. And we want it. (laughs) Yep. And as far as the introspection goes, I mean, that's what shifting points of view are for. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I find it very difficult to, I mean, I like a limited point of view. Um, I don't like omniscient at all, but I do like to know what's going on in this person's head. And especially if they're butting heads with another person, I would like to know what's going on in the other person's head at the same time, because I want to see where that conflict is in a more objective sense. Um, right. And so in in these romantices that we've been writing, um, you know, we have the two protagonists and they're not necessarily butting heads but they're clearly there's a misunderstanding or there's something they don't quite um and it's interesting to me to kind of contrast what's going on in one head versus what's going on in the other to kind of figure out um <clears throat> what where their truth kind of lies and find that kind of middle ground and i think that that came into play a lot more in the last book yeah did a lot mm-hmm. more yeah well and- quinn is that that character quinn is a very close to the best guy so the only way for me to let anybody know what was going on with him was to have him sit there and think deeply about it for about a chapter. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. well, they're in a they're in a complicated situation yeah. where there's a lot of misunderstanding and pain. So, mm-hmm. and it's really I don't think I think even if Quinn weren't so close to the the vest, he it would still be one of those things where a lot of it would have to have been been through introspection. Yeah, because not that that's true. Yeah, it's such a complicated situation we put them in because that's fun. (laughs) And it's fun to read too. You don't necessarily want to read about a straightforward problem with a straightforward solution. That's generally what kids' books are for. It's a very short book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not to say there isn't a place for it. Sure. You know, and we, I think we do a little bit here and there use it sort of in minor ways but not the the overarching plot because sometimes you're like I just want to fix this one thing and then we can get back to (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. well you you have to have little hills and valleys too because otherwise it's just boring if like everything just goes wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong yeah then you just feel bad for the poor character and you're like I don't want to read anymore (laughs) Gotta let him have an occasional victory. Yeah, yeah. But it has to be earned. I'm I'm a big yeah. believer in that earned victory. I don't want it to just be all happy, fluffy stuff. Like I'd lose interest in that so fast. I'm like, nope. Yeah, no, not no, no. I just mean <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I just mean give them some hope, you know, that yeah, maybe things could yeah. turn out okay. And give the reader some hope too exactly. that maybe things could turn out okay. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. So yeah. like uh to use one really easy example, the Game of Thrones. If you just decide what's the worst thing that could possibly happen, you can bet the farm that that is what will happen. It is that consistent. Uh-huh. It's just, mm-hmm. he, he he took it to the point of just being unbelievably predictable. And uh-huh. people were all like, oh, Game of Thrones, you don't know what's going to happen. I'm like, well, yeah, you do. It's just like the worst thing, that's what will happen. Don't get attached because that person will die horribly. Like, yeah. God, it's going to be God awful. I'm not. You know, and I think that's why I never got into Game of Thrones in the way that a lot of people thought I would. They're like, oh, but it's right up your alley. And I'm like, mm, but is it? I've read your book. Not really, no. No, no, it's not. It just makes me mad. I just walk away from it mad. I'm like, Ugh. Yeah, that nobody ever gets to hope for anything or, or think that anything good is ever going to happen to them because nothing ever does. No, no. And yeah, I, I, it's just, it's not, it's not my thing. I know there are people out there who like it. It's not my thing. Yeah. You no, want those either. hills and valleys. You want that, that rise and fall of emotion. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. No, I Maybe. mean, yeah. You want to give the, the character a reason to keep slogging through because, you know, maybe something will turn out. And if, you know, realistically, if all anybody ever faces is is death and destruction and sadness Tragedy. and pain, there's a point yeah. at which they're going to be like, what is the point of any of this? I'm going to stop. Right. You want them to keep right. going because something good could happen, you know? Exactly. Exactly. You want a, a sense that sense of hope. I mean, that's not to say we're not absolutely terrible to our characters sometimes. 
and we just than I am we I know but like I'll say something expecting okay she's gonna hold me back she's gonna hold me back and then you're like no but what if we do this and it's worse <laughs> oh, that's fair <laughs> yeah I build Ross. on I build on your torture <laughs> You do. We just, what it is, is we just feed each other. (laughs) We're like, Mm -hmm. okay, but we can make it worse. (laughs) Yep. So, And that kind of boils down to trust when, you know, one person looks at a a story they think is perfectly good. And the next person says, no, we got to make this change. And and there's going to be times when maybe you're not sure if that's the pin to use. We've run into that a few times yeah. where we're, yeah. we've been, one of us will think, oh, this is good. And the other will be like, mm. <laughs> no, <Yeah. laughs> what I've yeah. discovered more often than not with that though, is what we do is we'll take like bits and pieces of the different ideas and then find the right answer. Cause we've had elements of it. Yeah. I mean, the trick is to kind of boil it down to what was it specifically that appealed to you about this, that we need to keep. And then what was it that, uh, that didn't work and that we need to get rid of and how can we right. so it really is a it, it's learning how to kind of dissect each other's work mm-hmm. um and to be willing to toss the aesthetic out the window because a lot of times somebody will do something or whatever that looks really cool but then you look back and you're like that's nah, not that no that this if they do that not. then yeah it looks cool but then that completely negates this entire plot point so we have to exactly but I think as a result of that, we've always ended up coming out with something that's better than what either one of us had. Like when we, we take the two things, because we each had the like one element that was good. And then we take them and mix them and we're like, yes. <laughs> so I think that that has resulted a lot. Yeah, I, you froze for a second, Kristen. So did there you. you. <laughs> um, oh, great. Go me. Uh, I think that one of the ways that that has really manifested is um, plotting. And I'm thinking specifically of Lady of the Lock where we're like, well, it's a pretty good, it's an okay plot. We have all these elements. Oh and then suddenly I came up with like a single thing. thing. And I was like, what if we, and she was like, give me that ball. I'm running with it. And she did. <laughs> and suddenly it was a, you know, we went from being a story that was this good to being a story that was this good, you know? I, yeah. And that's really exciting when that happens. Yeah, that was, I'm really, and I was really, it's so funny with Lady of the Lock, I was really getting just like, just disheartened and I was losing my connection to it because I was like, this is just not gelling. And I, I loved what we'd written years and years ago just for fun. And then you came up with that one thing and it all just crystallized into this perfect thing, you know? it was mm-hmm. it was mm-hmm. that well, moment similar thing in agent of change yeah similar situation in agent of change too where we were like let's make this one small change and suddenly everything kind of built and it, yeah, and it, it was this beautiful tower in. of excitement yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that's always so exciting when suddenly you just hit it and healer's touch just like that one was just like okay we know what happens <laughs> that one was so easy Except we didn't, it, yeah, it was, but we didn't necessarily know, but then it was a lot of like, oh, what if we do this? And then, yeah, it, that, that just came out. That just was a beautiful, it just like was pulling a cake out of the oven. Yeah, it was cake. It was great. Ross. <laughs> <laughs> so I will tell you, Aaron, <laughs> I'll tell you, Aaron, that we wrote Healer's Touch, which is the second book, before we actually wrote Sears Choice, which is the first. Well, before because we cleaned we it up. Because the for- bare bones. Yeah, I mean, we had the bare bones of Sears Choice down, but we were like, there's going to be a lot of things happening in this second book that we're going to need to refer to in the first book. And, and so we, we should write this first. And we did. And then we went back and we were able to, as we were then cleaning up and, and, and perfecting Sears Choice, we were able to refer to and, and hint about things that we knew were going to happen down the road, which is really hard to do if you don't necessarily know that that's you know, if you don't already have that, yeah. that stuff in place, it's really hard to, because then you, you know, you lay an Easter egg and then you forget about it. <laughs> it's just sort of lying. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I didn't well, follow up on that. And the beautiful thing about that too, is we were actually able to refine some of the stuff for Healer's Touch when we went back in to add those Easter eggs. And then we were able to really refine how it came together in Healer's Touch. And out of mm-hmm. all of them, those are the two that are the most like interconnected. There are things in Sears Choice that really are not resolved to the end of the second book 
Right, they're in the timeline, they're literally days apart. Um, and involve, you know, the same cast pretty much. And so. Yeah, those are the two most ensemble books. The other two were like, let's not put ourselves through that again. <laughs> That's not right. Well, Lady of the Luck is time. definitely not. But, you know, Asian of Change does kind of swing back around to the more ensemble, at least at the very end. Lady of the Lock swings back around toward the latter third of the book. Yeah, a little bit. Back around. So. Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all kind of at some point we do get our characters together because I think that I think a big part of what works in the series is the relationships between the group and and how it's sort of a chosen family yeah. that that shows. I think that's a really strong theme through the series, actually, is their chosen families. That's something fans mm -hmm. really, really mm -hmm. glom onto. It, no matter what fandom they're in, because I think a lot of us are in a position where we either don't have a family or the family we have is less than ideal and we have to decide who we really want to call, put in that group and it's hard to make those decisions and it's hard to know those are your decisions to make yeah yeah so i think you know and i think yeah. sometimes too you just through life and uh, especially in adulthood you just you find the person, you, the people you gravitate toward, the people that you do go to for support. And, and it's not always like blood family. I'm, I'm very blessed in that my family is quite close and we're very supportive of one another. But I also have people who are chosen family. I mean, Jen is one of them. So, you know, for me, it's a mix of the two, yep, but I, yep. I just think it's important. So. And I do think well, that think we also demonstrate- a mix of the two if you can. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that we demonstrate some of the characters yeah. certainly do. Some of them do have, you know, mm -hmm. blood relatives that they're very Some of them, blood. and some of them definitely don't. Yep, some of them definitely some have of them issues. definitely don't, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a nice... Well, we're, we're coming up on the end of our hour here, and I think I, I'm going to borrow the two of you, and when it comes to family, I'm going to ask that people pick up this book but there are a lot of creative people who are listening to this who maybe would like to write a book or think that they're going to get started and it's going to go nowhere. And you two have been so successful in putting an idea on paper and getting it out to their fans. Can you give them some advice on how to get from where they are to maybe where you guys are? Well, I mean, for one thing, I, I think just, just start, you know, don't, don't psych yourself out too much. Just, start and don't worry about whether or not it's perfect when you first get it on the page it's not it just isn't just just right never mm -mm. No, never perfect when you first get it out yeah i think the first the first step is to just get the whole thing out get it out of your head and then go back to the beginning and start over but um i also think it's important whether you're writing by yourself or with a co-author i think it's important to assemble a team of folks whose opinions you trust um and that's you know somebody who uh somebody who, who understands the magic system, if that's part of it, or somebody who understands the history, if that's part of it, or somebody who understands certainly uh, somebody that you trust that has a real good grip on, on grammatical and idiomatic, uh, all kinds of phrasing. Um, because I think that, I know that Kristen and I both, we also rely on outside sources, even though we are each other's sort of primary source. Um, we do have a team that we rely on to look at the product and be like, okay, this didn't make enough sense. This needs more polish. Um, I don't like that guy. <laughs> you know, um, so I think, I think it's important to, to put together a team that you trust and say, listen, I want to do this. Can you, you know, do you mind giving me some backup? And being okay with hearing what you need to work on and you know, mm -hmm. listening to it. And, you know, yeah, I just think that that's really important. Just getting and, and having those people within that team who are not afraid to tell you that, who are not afraid to tell you what needs to be fixed, like not even just on like a technical yeah. uh, front, but just right. Don't take it okay personally. It mm -hmm. And it's not always easy. Yep. Don't fall so in love with your stuff. It's not, but like you have to not fall in love with your hmm. characters or your situation. 
you got to be open to to uh, constructive criticism and, and you got to recognize that it's not meant to be personal and just don't take yeah. it personally. I mean, I do fall in love with my stuff and my characters, but I also like I care about it enough to want it to be good to step to set the ego aside and go, OK, I love this character. So I, how do I make sure everybody else does, too? Unless the yeah. is, the idea is I love this character. How do I make sure everybody hates them? You know, <laughs> sometimes that's the point. <laughs> Okay. Well, mm -hmm. thank you both so much. I do appreciate this. And I want to make sure everybody has a chance to read your books and see you at the con. So where can they follow your adventures and pick up these books? Uh, well, I'm on Facebook and grudgingly on Twitter and really grudgingly on TikTok as of last night <laughs> and on Instagram. And then they can go to the Boundless Fantasy uh, Wix.com site. And that's where all of the uh, my books and all of the Fate Touch Chronicles are. And then I also have links to Jen's other books that she's written. Awesome. So you can also find me on the Boundless Fantasy website. Um, and I too am on Twitter and on uh, Instagram and um, I have not yet, yet ventured into TikTok, um, but you know, Amazon's the easiest and quickest way to go. Mm -hmm. Facebook is probably also a really easy, quick way to go. There's a boundless fantasy page with all the links. I post a lot of links. <laughs> yeah. I will have links to all that, both collaborative and personally on my website, aaronbossig.com on the show notes for this episode. Ladies, thank you both so much. I would like to have both of you back separately or together anytime. Yay. That'd okay. be great. Oh, thanks. We do have another series in the works. So maybe in a few uh, months we'll Trilogy. revisit. Looking forward to it. <laughs>